<laughs> All right. Yes, that's David Bean, ladies and gentlemen. All right, our devotion today is from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. And it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, guys. You guys can have a seat. All right, so one misconception that we've cleared up, I hope, pretty well is that the Beatitudes are not how you get to the kingdom of yes. heaven, but they're how you live yes. in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, yes, yes. Another misconception that most of us have got cleared up by now is that the Beatitudes are not a buffet. You can't take what you like and leave what you don't. They all come together. But in all seriousness, here is a misconception that Jesus wants to remove from you. We think that if we lived out the Beatitudes perfectly, then people will like us. That will be accepted because we're nice. I mean, think about this. If you were, you know, nice, gentle, kind, doing the right thing, merciful, making peace, telling people about God, that sounds like you would be the most popular guy on the street. But the reality is, guys, no one has ever lived at the Beatitudes except for Jesus, and they killed him. Jesus is warning us here in Matthew 5.10 that if you live out the Beatitudes as he's calling you to, you will be unpopular. Now, your family will likely like you, especially since I'm looking at this great group of kids. Yeah. But in the world, you will not be accepted. And the only way that you're going to keep living out the Beatitudes when people are rejecting you is if you believe the reward is worth it. So Jesus says you are blessed if you live this way because you will be given the kingdom of heaven. And if you don't believe the kingdom of heaven is worth it, you will stop. But if you do, you will keep going. Now, if you're anything like me, and you are, because you're humans, this is your faith in Jesus' promises. Right? Some days I really believe, and some days I really do not. Because you're not alone in that, and that's never really going to stop. But I want to give you some encouragement that you'll get from the Gospel of Mark tonight. You can ask Jesus for more faith. My favorite story in the entire Gospel of Mark is when the man with the demon-possessed son comes to Jesus and says, heal my son if you can. And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for those who believe. And the man says the most amazing thing, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus answers that prayer. So if you're having a hard time right now, motivating yourself to keep the Beatitudes, knowing that it's going to cost you, you can say to the Lord, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That is a prayer he accepts. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we believe, please help our unbelief. You are generous and kind. You are patient with struggling sinners like us. So I ask God that you would give all of us a deeper faith to believe that Jesus is worth it, no matter what it costs. Pray that you would bless our time together today. Give us wisdom and insight. Grow our love for you and for one another through time in your word. And I pray that you would heal our friends who are still home and you would bring them back soon. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, let's go over our verses. Let's say Matthew 5, 13 together. Uh, three times once Thomas puts his chair back on the ground. Uh, one, two, three. You are, you are the salt, salt of the earth, earth but if salt has, has lost its taste, its taste how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Again, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. One more time. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. All right. Verse 14, three times. One, two, three. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15, three times. One, two, three. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. For those of you who are watching this uh, from at home and you think I've lost my mind, we talked yesterday about that great Sunday school song, Hide Under a Bushel. No, we're going to let it shine. That's why I said no. All right, verse 16, three times. One, two, three. 
In the same way, let your light shine, let it shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In the same way, let your light shine before all. Okay, if you're going to be a clown, you got to keep up. You're slowing everybody down. One, one more time. One, two, three. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Thirteen through sixteen. Once. One, two, three. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We're going to say 9 through 16. That's everybody, including Luke Likens. 1, 2, 3. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Excellent. All right. Uh, what page are we on our notes? Yeah. No, 46. Somewhere in the 50s. All right. As you're turning there. Uh, I've got some questions here that folks have asked while I'm thinking about it. Sadler, Cole, Rocco, you guys have our questions for tomorrow. Um, so, why does it say the disciples' hearts were hardened after Jesus walked on water? So, the Bible uses uh, poetic language, like talking about how you might say sunrise or sunset. You know the sun doesn't literally rise or set, but you use common language to explain a phenomenon. So, the Bible isn't saying that the disciples' heart was turning to literal stone. It's simply describing that when you see something that God does or you hear something from God's word and you do not respond appropriately, your heart becomes harder and it becomes more difficult to respond. Okay, So we see the Pharisees' hearts are hardened. In the book of Exodus, you remember the Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And this is what we all have to realize that every day you guys are in danger. Because every day you come to Bible class and most every day we're hearing from God's word. If we hear God's word and do not obey, our heart grows harder. So that is what it's saying. The disciples' hearts were hardened. Being if we have time at the end of the class, then we could, if you remember that question, if you want to jot it down, we can take it. But we'll just keep moving for today. Uh, why does Jesus tell confusing parables instead of teaching normally? <laughs> he says that they may see but not perceive. I think it's a great question. And if we're being honest, it's kind of a... Makes us feel uncomfortable. It's like Jesus is tricking them. Uh, and this is very similar to what we just talked about with our heart being hard. So when Mark says that about seeing but not perceive, hearing but not understanding, he's quoting from the book of Isaiah. And what Isaiah teaches, the same thing the rest of the Bible teaches. That's what I just said, that when we hear God's word and we don't respond, our hearts become hard. In Isaiah's day, this was the people of Israel and Judah. And God said to Isaiah, I've been warning them for a couple hundred years now. They've not listened but I want you to keep speaking. Right? And Isaiah was not speaking in parables. He was literally saying, if y'all don't repent, God's going to destroy us. Right? There was no hidden nuance there. But God said, I want you to keep speaking because they're going to keep ignoring you. And all that's happening is they're becoming more and more guilty. So the reason Jesus is speaking in parables is because the people he's speaking to, for the most part, have already hardened their hearts against God. And so the parables of Jesus are being used as evidence against them. Because think about it like this. Is there anything stopping people who genuinely want to know God from raising their hand and saying, 
what are you talking about? I don't understand. Or for waiting for Jesus outside of the house and saying, Jesus, I was here yesterday and you told a parable about wheat and I don't get it. I want to know. But most people heard Jesus are like, eh, he's weird and left. And that's just evidence of the hardness of their heart. So this is the parables are being used almost like a tool of judgment against them. All right. When Jesus heals the man with demons and sends the demons to the pigs, what happened to the demons when the pigs drowned? I don't think the demons died. I think they went wherever demons go. And we're talking about like demons don't have bodies. They're not just like <laughs> invisible. They don't have bodies. So I don't really know how to explain where they go when they're not possessing a creature. So into the air, for lack of a better term. Uh, but they didn't die. They didn't die. Just the pigs. Uh, why does Jesus only tell the crowd par parables, but his disciples the explanation? Uh, so yeah, kind of the same thing. That's He's telling the crowd parables, and he's almost, again, by the end of Jesus' ministry, there are a couple hundred people following him, and I bet you some of them were confused when they heard the parables, but I bet those people were the ones who stu stuck around and said, what did that mean? They told them, and they followed. So uh, we'll have more time at the end of the class if you guys still have a question, but thank you for your questions. Keep asking, keep thinking, keep being confused. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how we grow. All right, so what was the last blank I gave you? Uh, uh, Adam. I gave you 3.2. He's the true Israel. Adam. Well, my 3.2 is Jesus, the true Israel. Yeah. Yeah. And I finished that section, right? And so I'm at God's place. Is that right? Okay. All right. So I'm at 3.2. I'm at 3.2. Yes, Hannah. So next week, are we going to do the index cards as well? Or? Yeah, keep asking all these wonderful okay. questions. All right, so 3.2, I think is where I am, right? You're not going to let me crazy? Okay, so we talked yesterday. We were finally meeting Jesus, and we said that he is the true Adam. And now we're going to say also that Jesus is the true, here's your blank, Israel. He is the true Israel. So the New Testament makes clear that Jesus is sort of reenacting the story of the Old Testament, but he's getting it right where Israel got it wrong. So, for example, like Israel, Jesus, here's your blank, passed through the waters. For the people of Israel, the waters in question were the Red Sea leaving Exodus and the Jordan River when Joshua led them into the Promised Land. Where was Jesus baptized? In the Jordan. Where did he go after he was baptized? Into the wilderness, just like the Exodus generation. So Jesus is in one story reenacting both of those stories. So he passed through the waters, and also like Israel, Jesus, here's your blank, was tempted in the desert. But unlike Israel, thank God, when Jesus is tempted, he doesn't give in. Also, as one final little linkage here, how many disciples did Jesus call? Twelve. How many tribes are in Israel? Twelve. Twelve. Yes, that's not an accident, not a coincidence. Twelve is not Jesus' favorite number. He's choosing this because he is intentionally reforming a new Israel around him as the centerpiece. So from this point forward, from the moment Jesus steps on the scene, the true Israel, a true Israelite, are not those, here's your blank, genetically, genetically descended from Abraham. So it doesn't matter if you're living in 21st century America today and you can trace your lineage all the way back to Father Abraham himself. You are not a true Israelite unless you trust Christ. So from this point forward, the true Israel are those who have, here's your blank, trusted in Jesus, who is himself the true Israelite. Remember, Israel was meant to obey God. They failed. They did not. Jesus perfectly obeyed God's law. He is the true Israelite. So that's how God is keeping his promise regarding God's people. True Adam, true Israel. What about God's place? Well, the tabernacle and the temple that we talked about in the Old Testament were just shadows. Jesus is the true, here's your blank, temple. He is the true temple, the place where we can actually enter into God's presence. Because in Christ, God himself has drawn, here's your blank, near to us. He has drawn near to us. So let's look at both of those claims. First claim, Jesus is the true, here's your blank, tabernacle. Tabernacle. Now, this might be the most one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. I know that you've heard what I'm about to say to you. But John 1.14, it says, And the Word, talking about Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So I know that you have been told before that that English word dwelt is the Greek word for tabernacle transformed into a verb. Literally said, 
What this verse says is the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So John is saying in the Old Testament, they had a tent. And that's where the glory of God dwelt among his people. Now we have Jesus. And that's where the glory of God dwells among his people. So he's the true tabernacle and Jesus is the true, here's your blank, temple. In John chapter 2, which Lord willing you guys will read next week, Jesus goes to the temple and he's talking about all those stones and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And everybody thinks he's crazy. He's standing in the middle of not just the temple that was rebuilt after the exile, but King Herod, yes, the Herod who killed all the babies in Bethlehem, had spent 45 years building up this temple. It was one of the most magnificent buildings in the ancient world, almost as good as when Solomon built it. And Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And everybody thought he was nuts. And then John adds a little comment. After the resurrection, the disciples realized Jesus was talking about his body. His body is the place where we meet God. So if you want to meet with God, don't go to a, here's your blank, building. Don't go to a building. Go to, here's your blank, Jesus. Go to Jesus. So one more thing I want to show you about this idea about being God's place. And that's a link between John 7 and Ezekiel. So in John 7, Jesus is standing in the temple, and he says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, those are beautiful words, and I bet some of y'all have, or your grandma has, a little cross stitch hanging in her house somewhere about rivers of living water, or come to me and drink, and it is a beautiful image. But Jesus is not pulling these words out at random. He's pulling these images from the Old Testament. So in Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel is having a vision of God's future temple. Now, spoiler alert, though Ezekiel sees a temple in his vision, I'm pretty sure it's not a real temple that's going to be rebuilt one day in the future. He's talking about Jesus. And what does Ezekiel see? Well, then he, the angel, brought me, Ezekiel, back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east. So here's a temple with water flowing out of it. And if we had read from Ezekiel 47.1 to 47.12, everywhere that water goes, life springs up around it. It ends in verse 12, and it says, And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water from them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing." And if you really want to get a little trip going on here, so that's Ezekiel. We just read from John. Here's what we read in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, just to kind of show you the unity of Scripture from beginning to end. Here's John's vision of paradise. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's Ezekiel's river in the new heavens and new earth. That river flows out of Jesus. Yes. It also said there was 12 fruits. 12 fruits. There's that number 12 again. Yes. So add it all together. It's very clear. Jesus is that temple and the water is the, here's your blank, spirit. The water is the spirit he gives to all who trust in him. Jesus brings life to his people through giving him his spirit which we'll maybe talk about today, but if not, Lord willing, we will definitely talk about tomorrow. So that's God's people. That's God's place. What about God's rule and blessing? Well, Jesus introduces that new covenant that we introduced in the book of Jeremiah. So Jesus says that he has come to, here's your blank, fulfill the law. Jesus has come to fulfill the law, not get rid of it, but fulfill it. And he fulfills it in two ways. First, he perfectly, here's your blank, obeys its demands. Everything the law required of you, Jesus actually did it. Can you believe it, that Jesus actually honored his father and mother? Jesus did not roll his eyes when they said, clean your room. Jesus actually shared with his brothers and sisters what his parents told him to. It's hard to believe, but he did it perfectly at all times. But he also fulfilled the law because he, here's your blank, dies in our place. The law is fulfilled through Jesus' obedience, and the demand of the law for our failure is fulfilled through his death. Anna? Situation. I'm betting a lot. Yeah. I'm betting a lot. Yeah. You, you, probably, he's probably always his parents' favorite. 
Almost certainly. Yes, yes, yes. So Galatians 3, 13 through 14 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So because Jesus did this, because he both fulfilled the law and accumulated righteousness and died in our place, a wonderful swap takes place. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the swap. Here's the exchange. Jesus takes our sin and, here's your blank, punishment. He takes our sin and punishment. We get his, here's your blank, righteousness. Okay, all of the righteousness that Jesus accumulated through a perfect life of obedience, we get it. And he gets all of the sin and the curse and the death that we've accumulated through our life of disobedience. And as a result, there is a new covenant. Hebrews 9.15, he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant. Remember, a mediator, someone who stands between two parties. So Moses mediated the old covenant, but Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. We'll take a three-minute break here and talk about Jesus the King. All right, so I'm going to take this moment, shh, guys. I'm going to take this moment uh, to remind you of one thing and then tell you about something new. Call you listening. Uh, first thing, this is something you already know. When I give you a memory verse quiz back, you don't have to keep it. But it has to end up in a trash can if you don't want it. If I find your quiz on the ground, I'm going to start taking points off of your quiz. Do not leave it on the floor. Okay. Second thing, and this is new, so you'll want to look up here. You want to pay attention. So up until this point for the year, basically every homework assignment has been out of 30 points. And all I'm really been looking for, Colin, all I'm really looking for is... Did you do those summaries? I uh, may write a note, like if you don't annotate anything, I'm like, you know, annotate or I may take off, of, of, you know, five points here, 10 points there. And then, but what I'm really looking for is that you write those three summaries. So if you run all three summaries, pretty much you're gonna get a 30 out of 30. But as I've been saying to you for the last week plus, I want your handwriting on every single page of the homework assignment. So to both reward those of you who are crushing it, and to motivate those of you who need to pick it up a little bit, I'm going to now incorporate that into your grade. And here's how it's going to work. So uh, let's say that you have a homework assignment, three chapters. And so there's, ten, there's three summaries. They're worth 10 points each. So that's 30 points, right? And then it's seven pages long. Like those three chapters take up seven printed pages. I'm counting each page is worth five points. I should see your handwriting on all seven pages. So that's 35 points. So now your homework assignment is a 65 point assignment. Okay. So if Hannah turns in her homework and she has read, annotated, and summarized all of the chapters, then she'll get a 65 out of 65. But if Vail, notorious slacker, um, if Vail does only two of the summaries and only annotates three of those pages, well then she's gonna get a 35 out of 65. So what I would tell you is this, obviously, ideally, you're gonna do your homework, you're gonna turn in what it's due, and you're gonna be blessed by your careful study of God's word and with an A in this class. However, uh, let's say, and this is not an if, but a when, let's say that when you forget your Bible homework, and you don't remember to like 7.53, Oh my gosh, I have Bible homework today. Your first instinct is going to be to grab your homework, scan it, circle some things, underline some things, write some trash summaries, and turn it in. Now, sometimes I'm going to catch you. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes you're not going to complete the assignment. But just remember, all you lose if you turn it in one day late is 11%. So let's say that 65 point homework assignment, if you turn it in one day late, it's a 58 out of 65. That's still an A. I suspect that the reason some of us uh, would rather turn in bad homework is probably because the night before, 
the night before, uh, when you asked your mom if you could go to so-and-so's house or if you could play video games, she asked you, is all your homework done? And you said, yes, ma'am. And if you get an incomplete email sent home to your mom, she gonna have some questions for you when you get home. So I get it. But what I would tell you is one, this is okay. Remember how we just talked about our hearts becoming hard? So here in all seriousness, here's an opportunity for us to live out our faith. Okay, so let's say you honestly forgot. Like when you told your mom your homework is done, you honestly thought it was, you just actually forgot. Okay, that's a bad choice, it's not a sin. You forgot, you're human. So own up to it, don't pretend, don't be fake. Don't do a bad job on your homework. Don't dishonor God's word by just throwing it in there, you know, not having read it. Go home, own up to it. Option two, you lied to your mom when you said that you didn't have homework because you thought I can do it before school and then you forgot to do it before school. <laughs> Don't lie to your parents because what you're doing, honestly, what you're doing when you, when you give me homework that you have not read, you are representing to me that you have read it. So you lie to your mom about not about doing your homework and your solution to that lie is to lie again. That is not a good habit you want to get into. That is how our hearts become hard. Because we sin and we add sin to our sin to cover up our sin. That's how our hearts become hard. So obviously, I want you to do your homework on time. But if you don't do your homework on time, you're not going to get kicked out of the school. Just take the L, do lunch detention, do a good job on your homework, and turn it in. Okay? So that's what your homework grade. It'll be different every day depending on how long it is. But that's what our homework will look like moving forward. Clayton, you had a question. Uh, totally forgot. Thomas, you had a question. Uh, never mind. Anna, you had a question. Excuse me? Well, yes and no. Like, I'm going to look and, for example, if you did the, th the three summaries, as I've asked you, and you have annotated, like if I see handwriting and things underlined and circled, then like, yeah, that's, I'm not, I'm not going to come to you like, Anna, why'd you circle this? Why'd you underline that? Why'd you, like, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but it's not just doing it. Like, you know, if I'm spot checking things, I'm like, you wrote 12 words for your summary. Like that's not, you didn't complete it. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not reading it and being like, is this a sufficient summary of this chapter? Like I'm, I'm, there has to be some trust here. I have 95 of you. I can't read every word you write every single day. It's not going to happen, but I can spot check and make sure that you're doing it. So just do it. Hannah. Yeah, you would think, but I never, I never underestimate the ability of people to forget things. Last question, David. Uh, sometimes, again, I spot check things, and what I learned last year is I know what, I know what twenty-eight to thirty-two words looks like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Honestly, like I'm not. There's certain kids who like I feel really confident that they did what I asked. And there are other kids where it's like, I'm probably more likely going to check that one. But it's really all just a spot check. It's spot check. All right. So if you have questions, you can ask me later. But that's the homework. That's the deal. All right. So we are looking at 5.2. 5.2. So we're still in the present kingdom. So we looked at, yes. Did you continue your recording? Yes, I did, thankfully. Thank you for reminding me. All right. So I'm at God's rule and blessing. And the rule comes through two avenues. Avenue one, the new covenant that we just talked about before the break. Avenue two, that God's rule is going to be mediated, is through the king, who, coincidentally enough, is also Jesus. So remember, we said that the prophets made it clear that all of God's promises are going to be fulfilled by a new king who is a descendant of David. And when you know it, that's what Jesus is. And Jesus, as we talk about every day in here, died, but thankfully, he didn't stay dead. He was risen from the dead. And the resurrection does a lot of things for us as Christians. One of the things that does is it proclaims something about Jesus. It proclaims that Jesus is not simply the son of, here's your blank, David. David had many sons, and those sons had many sons, and those sons had sons, and they all died, and they all got buried, and they all stayed dead. Jesus is not just a biological descendant of David. He is also the son of, here's your blank, God. He is the son of God. Romans 1.4, Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. And add all that together, new covenant, new king, Jesus is the, here's your blank, source. Jesus is the source 
of God's blessing. Come to me, Jesus says, only me. There is no one else. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I, I alone, no one else will give you rest. Do you remember all the way back on the first page of this unit, we talked about how rest is the goal of creation. God created us to enter into his rest, and Jesus gives us that rest. When you trust in Christ, you're not just securing your place in heaven. You are living life as it was meant to be lived. Okay, Bean, you had a question? I was going to say, I spelled my name wrong in the David, and I... See, this is why I said I never underestimate the ability of eighth grade students to forget homework and school day or to spell their own name wrong. All right. So all of this happens. How does the king, let's not, how does the king bring in his new reign? Well, it happens at the cross. And at the cross, two blanks, salvation through substitution. The king is going to initiate, inaugurate his new reign at the cross, where we will see salvation through substitution. Does anybody right now in this room have, obviously particularly the ladies, have a either a necklace or an earring, a piece yes. of jewelry that has a cross on it? I have an anchor. That's good enough. Okay. So we probably have seen things like this. Guys, you probably have seen things like this where we have cross jewelry or necklaces or t-shirts. We have it somewhere on us. And, and we as Christians like to talk about the cross for good reason. But understand how profoundly weird that is. Because the cross is not just something meant to kill people. It's meant to torture, humiliate, and shame people. The Romans reserved the cross for their worst enemies because they not only wanted to kill you, but humiliate you. It is profoundly weird that as Christians we talk about the cross, but we don't just talk about the cross. Listen to what Paul said. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm not just going to admit that Jesus got crucified. I'm going to brag about it. I'm going to brag that Jesus was crucified. Because despite the outward appearance, the cross is not a failure. It's a triumphant, here's your blank, success. The cross is Jesus's victory. God's kingdom could have come no other way. We talk a lot about God's character, how he's holy, he's righteous, he's just. So to put it like this, something had to be done about sin and God's anger against it. And there's really three options. Option one, God, here's your blank, ignores our sin. But upon closer examination, option one is not an option. If God ignores our sin, he is no longer holy. He is no longer righteous, he is no longer just, and therefore he is not God. So option one, not an option. Option two is a very real option. God punishes, here's your blank, us for our sin. The second option for how God can deal with sin and his anger is he can punish us. And again, to say things that we're not comfortable saying but must say, what's happening in hell right now is option two. That is option two. But option three, and thank God there's an option three, God punishes someone, here's your blank, else for our sin. And this is what Paul says in Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. So Christ's death for our sins shows God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, which means patience, he had passed over former sins. So God had been keeping track of every sin ever committed, not because he's a softy, not because he doesn't actually want to punish anyone, but because he was going to punish his son for it. So at the cross, four things are happening. One, here's your blank. The holiness of God was displayed. If you want to know how much God refuses to be in the presence of sin, look at the cross. At the cross, the wrath of God was displayed was poured out. If you want to know how much God hates sin, look at the cross. At the cross, here's your blank, the justice of God was satisfied. I'm going to quote from John Piper, every sin ever committed will be punished either at the cross or in hell. God has dealt with every sin, mine and the sin of anyone else who will trust in Christ. And at the cross, the love of God was demonstrated. We're often going to feel like God has forgotten about us, that God does not love us. And if you want to know how God feels about you, look at the cross. Very quickly, 
We'll look at uh, this last page here, images of salvation. So like a diamond, the cross is so beautiful that we can just turn it endlessly and look at it from different angles, and it's beautiful from every perspective. So let me give you some other images how the New Testament describes what Christ did for us. First, here's your blank, redemption. Redemption. 1 Peter 1, 18-19. Knowing that you were ransomed or redeemed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. So we were slaves to sin, and God bought you by the death of his son. Second, here's your blank, reconciliation. Reconciliation, R-E-C-O-N-C-I-L-I-A-T-I-O-N. You were enemies of God, not neutral, enemies all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You were God's enemies. You are now his friends, and you are going to go out and tell people about how they can be friends with God too. Redemption, reconciliation. Third, here's your blank. Justification, J-U-S-T-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. You were guilty, and God declared you righteous. Fourth, here's your blank. Conquest. Jesus defeated our enemies at the cross. Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And so this is why, this is why we have four gospels, because no one gospel can fully capture the beauty of Jesus. We get four complementary pictures, so that by reading them together, we get a fuller picture of who Jesus is and what he did. So just very briefly, what do we get in Matthew? Jesus is the, here's your blank, Christ. He is the Christ of the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus is the king we've been waiting for. In Mark, as you guys are discovering, Jesus is the, here's your blank, suffering servant. He is the suffering servant who calls us to suffer too. In Luke, we see that Jesus is the, here's your blank, savior of the world. That's why Luke traces the genealogy back to Adam. Jesus is here for all people. Salvation means forgiveness of sins. And salvation means the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in John, Jesus is the Son of God who gives eternal, here's your blank, life. Tomorrow we'll look at our role as we proclaim the kingdom until he comes. So we're done there. Bye. Bye.